SLS is a significant issue for NASA. Despite the fact that the rocket itself has undoubtedly encountered numerous problems, the underlying issue with the Space Launch System goes much deeper than simply being difficult to create. More than almost anything else, the current state of the space travel business, the political movements that support it are to blame for why SLS has become a milestone around NASA's figurative neck. However, let's first talk about Artemis 1 before moving on. Clearly, we are not discussing Artemis 1's magnificent launch into orbit at this time because it did not occur. In case you weren't aware, an engine problem that was detected in the final stages of the countdown caused NASA to cancel Monday's scheduled launch. At around 6 in the a.m. Eastern Time, NASA started the hydrogen kickstart phase of the launch, which involved letting the four RS-25 engines of the SLS cycle in some cryogenic liquid hydrogen fuel to get them ready for the launch's thermal stress. The engines need 500 Rankin, or around 4 or 5 degrees Celsius, according to NASA. The first three engines ran without a hitch, but the final one, engine number three, wasn't cycling gasoline as quickly as the others. The technicians attempted to increase the pressure in engine three's fuel pipes by cutting off the flow to the other engines, but it was unsuccessful. After spending more than an hour trying to find a solution, Technicians decided to cease trying to force the valves on the hydrogen fuel lines and declare a scrub. Managers had called for what was meant to be a brief hold at T-minus 40 minutes. The bleed line had a problem. The fuel delivery systems that supply the engines. Only three of the four engines were able to cycle properly, indicating that there was a problem with the system's ability to maintain constant pressure. Even if the SLS had been operating safely, NASA would still have had to scrub the launch on Monday due to the engine problems that caused the countdown to be stopped. Several hours after the scheduled launch time, storms that had been threatening the launch pad eventually made landfall. In fact, the fueling procedure had been halted earlier due to lightning strikes on the pad, making it already doubtful that Artemis 1 would have taken off that day. I'm not sure what the sea hag and NASA crossed, but it appears that they were cursed. Obviously, no one wants any rocket team to launch with faulty engines or during a storm, but it's difficult to keep from groaning in unison at yet another SLS error that should have been discovered during testing. Therefore, the pressing query is, why wasn't it? The simplest explanation is that NASA hasn't had time to fully analyze every potential issue because they've been so busy with the cycle of testing and repair operations. These engines hadn't had time to be tested yet, and more specifically, the bleed system. The prospect of finding a fault with this system was highlighted during flight readiness meetings, according to the mission manager for Mike Serafin Artemis 1. But eventually, NASA chose to proceed with the launch attempt. This was mainly due to the fact that there was not enough time after the wet dress rehearsal on June 20th, which revealed a leak in the rocket's umbilical feeds for any planned testing of the engine fuel line. However, it goes much beyond that. Since it was first introduced in 2011, SLS has seen numerous delays and NASA has had a very difficult time producing this item. Long before SLS was compelled to postpone its initial launch date of December 2016, modifications to construction facilities, hurricanes, tests, reports, and changes to assembly techniques entered the program. The program's delays and complexity were heavily impacted by changes in the political climate in the United States at the time. In addition to all of that, NASA has struggled greatly with the SLS complexity, and, to be honest, that alone would have been enough to delay the program. Actually, let's talk about that for a little while. Because the SLS construction by NASA shows the true nature of the issue. Without a doubt, we will need to use AI technology on our voyage to Mars. The Space Launch System is a Frankenstein and Administrator Bill Nelson is correct to point out that the main cause of all the delays is due to its complexity. The SLS design roadmap anticipates an astonishing amount of new technologies including a completely new propulsion system meant to work with later iterations of the platform. Block 2, which will be used after Artemis 8, is a significant upgrade to the SLS. Although that isn't what the rocket is at the moment, it has a lift capacity of about 130 metric tons. SLS is currently made up of repurposed components from the shuttle program the 1980s technology was initially intended simply to launch payloads into low Earth orbit. It will obviously take a lot of work to get that hardware to operate with the current systems so it can lift more weight far farther out. To their credit, NASA technicians have resolved each issue they've run into. The issue is that they've run into a lot of issues. Therefore, NASA is thinking of a better system. 
with upgraded hardware and a strategy to gradually phase out recyclable materials. However, why did they even bother using recycled parts in the first place? It's safe to say that designing and manufacturing a rocket with components that was meant to work together from the start would have been less expensive overall. Here, we begin to understand the underlying cause of the SLS problem. Public funds and ownership support NASA. They receive more or less all of their funding from the American government, which is obviously in a vulnerable position. NASA financing has always been based on what the administration might accomplish for the current administration in terms of bragging rights, as well as public interest in their initiatives. Once public interest waned, the Apollo missions came to an end. After the catastrophes involving the Challenger in Columbia, the shuttle program was abandoned. And over the past two decades, we have witnessed a gradual drop in financing that has reduced NASA's share of the American budget to less than 0.5%. They were aware that they couldn't possibly manufacture a new rocket on such slim margins, so NASA did what it does best. They used the parts they already had and worked on a tight budget to build a rocket that served its purpose and was planned to be modified as time and finances allowed. But their testing schedule also required some ingenuity. Administrator Jim Free was questioned about why NASA hadn't decided to conduct another wet dress rehearsal if they knew they hadn't tested all the components during the news conference held just hours after they scrubbed Artemis I. He responded that doing so would have given the rocket additional cycles, greater potential for damage during transportation or on the pad. Basically, if they launched a plan and it succeeded, excellent. If not, this would be considered another wet dress rehearsal, which says a lot about how much time and money NASA needs to devote to this undertaking. If this were SpaceX, they would have just continued testing until they were able to launch. NASA does not enjoy that luxury because each time they make a mistake, they are forced to defend their funds in front of the U.S. Congress. So why not use organizations like SpaceX? Over the years, NASA has been under heavy fire for not using commercial contractors to cut costs, notably for SLS. Having the comparison directly, it can't help that a Starship has moved in on Pad 39 and next door. However, there are a few aspects regarding commercial rocket businesses that we're forgetting. The first is that businesses only have a real obligation to their shareholders. Although SpaceX is not publicly traded, it is privately funded by venture capital and is nevertheless expected to make money for its investors. Elon can continue to detonate rockets without incident if those SpaceX investors are okay with it. NASA must once more provide a rationale for each pull and nut they purchase. Second, commercial businesses can and do receive capital from a variety of sources. Government funds are far more significant than contracts that private investors launch with donations that send wealthy people into space. Therefore, in practice, businesses like SpaceX occasionally receive government support at amounts comparable to those that NASA receives. They may even secure contracts with NASA in addition to their private funding sources. To make matters worse, NASA contracts are typically handed to contractors when they lack the cash to invest in building the necessary systems on their own. That must be a step back for the agency. Finally, commercial businesses may frequently justify investing on public relations to promote their products and educate the public, but NASA is simply unable to do so, and it is evident. Administrators of NASA frequently preside over news conferences. Some of them are professional politicians, but the majority are engineers. This leads to professionals, inexperienced in public speaking, giving answers that, at best, come out as patronizing. On the other hand, all SpaceX needs to do to get people excited about the most recent very heavy test is to have Elon post a Twitter thread. None of this implies that NASA is without responsibility for these problems. The few contracts that NASA can afford are frequently given to the same companies over and over again, rather than looking for new talent in businesses like Rocket Lab. Administrators frequently make decisions that appear to be made without understanding the scope of the work required. Attempts at public stunts, like the celebration planned for the Artemis I launch on Monday, frequently come off as cheesy and unnecessary. The public, which includes you and me, can't actually force a company into doing something, which is the largest distinction between private businesses and NASA. We can't truly prohibit Elon from launching vehicles into space forever, but if we tried, public pressure might force a change at NASA, and fervent public interest that could really help them secure funding. The whole history of NASA has been shaped by what political officials believe the public wanted to see. Recently, they've been trying to hand control of humanity's ascent to the sky to private corporations with no public scrutiny. Although there is still work to be done, NASA is our space agency. 
We must start speaking up about how we envision the future of humankind in space if we want things to improve. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget to share your ideas in the comments section below. We'd love to hear your input on this matter, and we'll be responding to a lot of your comments. Before we wrap up, it would mean the world to us if you all pounded the like and subscribe button. Our hearts are always full from your care, enthusiasm, and support. I guess it's farewells for now. Till the next video drop, you all take care.